All right. Great. We have one, two questions that were sent in uh, before today, and we got three questions this morning, right? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to deal with the questions. The first question we're going to deal with is what is exorcism? Is it practiced in the church today and how successful is it? Okay, for those of you who are writing down and if I have a scribe, Jenna, uh, if we talk about this, it's really difficult to deal with this um, because when the Bible talks about what we classify as exorcism, it doesn't use the word exorcism. Okay, so the word is not a biblical word, but it's a word to describe what was happening in an event or when Jesus was uh, doing things or when the disciples were doing things. Okay? So what is exorcism? Exorcism is simply exorcising, taking out, driving out the demonic spirit that could be in a person. That is indwelling a person. Exorcism is driving out, taking out the demonic spirit that may be in a person. I truly believe that if you are a Christian and you are born again truly by the spirit of the almighty God. You cannot be indwelled by demons. You may be oppressed and persecuted by demonic spirits, but you cannot be indwelt by demonic spirits. I'm going to deal a little bit with it when I get to the question that was asked about the uh, Jude verse 20 passage. That's another question that's asked about Jude uh, verse 20 where it talks about praying in the spirit. Okay. But how does exorcism happen? People, you remember in the time of Jesus uh, at least on one occasion Jesus was praying. When he came back, he had a woman that was telling him that she brought his son to the disciples. The son has been tormented by the spirit. And they could not cast it out. They could not exhaust it. They couldn't take it out of the, of the boy. And Jesus said, how long am I going to be with you? And don't you know that these things are done by prayer and fasting? So, Exorcism is still being done today. It's done, I believe, primarily by the power of the Holy Spirit through those who are getting people out of the enemy territory. People who are getting people out of bondage. Bondage by demonic spirits. Bondage by Satan. And we call it salvation. When a person is saved, you take them out of the control, the realm of demonic spirits. Now, there are some people who are not Christians who are indwelled by demonic spirits. And you can also exercise that by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've told you story, this story before. Uh, Pastor Small and I, a long time ago, 12, 20 years ago, I don't know how long ago, we um, were visiting someone who used to be a uh, member of Village Baptist Church. 
and became the pastor of Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church in Oakland. And uh, we were just visiting, and we went there, and that very day, uh, immediately the pastor saw me and Reverend Small come come into the church. He told me I was going to be preaching that night. I said, okay. Well, uh, during my preaching, there was a lady in there indwelled by demonic spirits. And she started cursing and doing everything and, you know, getting up and falling down and doing everything. And uh, Pastor Small and I told everybody that was in the congregation, if you are not a Christian, it's better that you leave this place right now. And if you're a Christian, you're not sure. Of your Christianity, you need to live. Because when we drive out that demon from her, it's going to find place in somebody else. And you better pray it's not you. And uh, we had some uh, exits. Uh, (laughs) Real quick, and I hope some of them were not deacons. (laughs) But... But it was really interesting from cursing God and screaming and shouting. By the time we finished praying in the spirit and praying for this lady, she finally said, Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is King. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's done every day. So it's not something unique. It's done every day in places in Africa, places in In Europe, Canada, America, it's done all over the place every day. The power of God is still alive. The power of God is still mighty. He has what we call omnipotent power. That is a big word for saying there's no power that's above the power of God. And he can do anything. And uh, he is still doing it. So uh, how successful is this? I don't know. I don't know because I don't have statistics. I have not, you know, seen any studies that shows how many people have been delivered by exorcism. Uh, The Catholic Church practices it a lot as one of their ministries. Uh, But we as a church, we're open to the spirit of the Almighty God leading whenever it is needed, we are ready to exercise the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, because the power is not from the preacher. The power is not from even a member of the church that has uh, the power of the Holy Spirit being exercised in their life in a mighty way. The power is of the Lord. Hey, Hope, what's up? (laughs) What's up, Hope? The power is of the Lord, and God is doing it, and he is still doing it. He did it in the New Testament time. In fact, he did it in the Old Testament. He did it in the New Testament time. He did it in the intertestamental period. He is doing it today, and he's doing it all across the world. And power of God is still mighty indeed. Amen? Praise the Lord. What was the second question? The difference between being spiritual and a spiritual list. Being spiritual is being pneumaticus. Pneumaticus. P N E P N E U M A T I. C-U-S. Pneumaticus. Okay. It's pneumaticus is from pneuma. Pneuma is the word for spirit. And being uh, spiritual is being in the spirit. Okay. Get it. Being spiritual doesn't mean being quiet. Looking like somebody stole your dollar. Okay. Being spiritual 
is being in the spirit. And we're going to talk about that again. And being in the spirit is being indwelt by the spirit of the almighty God. And how can you be indwelt by the spirit of the almighty God is that you are born again by that spirit. The spirit of the almighty God. When you are born again by the spirit of the almighty God, you are automatically spiritual. It is left to you to walk in the Spirit. To be filled by the Spirit on a regular basis every day. Because for us as Christians, we accumulate garbage. And God doesn't want garbage in our lives. When we, when we leave that garbage in us, we stink. In order for you to be spiritual, in order for you to be pneumaticus, you have to allow the spirit, the pneuma of God to come in and clean your garbage. That is called the filling of the Holy Spirit and that is consciously requested and practiced by the Christian on a regular basis. Amen? So, being in the spirit is being spiritual. Being a spiritualist is somewhat secular. Because in the Christian tradition, you cannot be a spiritualist. Are you still with me? And the reason why you cannot be a spiritualist is we don't control the pneuma. We don't control the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you cannot give the Holy Spirit. We are spiritual, but we are not spiritualists. Those who are spiritualists are not necessarily Christians. In fact, if they're Christian, they won't be practicing that. Because you can't give the spirit to anybody. So you can have a person be a Jehovah Witness. You can have a person be a Buddhist. You can have a person be uh, following Hare Krishna. You can have a person be... Uh, a Muslim, and they just say, well, I'm a spiritualist. In other words, I follow anything spiritual. And therefore, they can call themselves either interdenominational, interfaith, and interdenominational a little bit, maybe a, a little bit problem, but more specifically interfaith, where you don't uh, discriminate against any faith. In other words, we're all going to, to God. Every way leads to God. That's what a spiritualist will tell you. And uh, I'll say, well, you're a liar because every way doesn't lead to God. Because God said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. I don't want you to be a spiritualist. I want you to be spiritual. And if you're spiritual, you're led by the Spirit of the Almighty God. Is there a follow-up question to that? I don't know who asked it. You did? Okay. Uh, did it, is there any section of that that did not touch a question that you have? Yes. No, yeah, thank you. Yeah, but you can correct him. And if he is a male chauvinist, whatever, you may just want to leave him alone. Okay? <laughs> uh, 
but but you're correct at what you told told him. Uh, we are not spiritualists. We are spiritual. And we're only spiritual because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And every Christian, if you're a true Christian, you, you should be spiritual. All right. Yes. Well, it's possible, but the danger is that sometimes when you believe something as hard as some people do, it's very hard to change. Okay? I deal with a lot of people, you probably do too, who say this, don't confuse me with the facts. I already made up my mind. In other words, people have their minds made up. They don't want you to tell them what the truth is because they have this idea that this is the truth. Truth should be open for any challenge and and confronted and dealt with and whatever. So uh, I don't think you can just transfer because you can come from anything to being a spiritual person, to being a Christian. You can come from Mohammedanism, you can come from Buddhism, you can come from uh, uh, Jehovah Witness or whatever and become a Christian. God does not discriminate. As long as you believe you are a sinner, as long as you believe that you can't save yourself, and you believe that God provided the uh, way to himself by the cross, and you believe and confess in the death, the resurrection, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you do what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't matter whether you're a spiritualist, a Buddhist, a Muslim, whatever. If you believe, you will be saved and you'll become spiritual. Question number three. Do you have to come to church every Wednesday and Sunday to be a Christian? The answer is no. But if you are a Christian, you will come every Wednesday and every Sunday. (laughs) Now, let me deal with it a little bit more in depth. Okay. The Bible says what we do to become Christian is not based on our economic stance, standard. It's not based on our race. It's not based on our country of origin. It's not based on our economic situation. Because when it comes to God, we are all in the same boat. We're all sinners. And there's only one way to get to God. At least if you believe the Bible. Okay, if you don't believe the Bible, you may find other ways. Okay, but if you believe the Bible to be the word of God, there is only one way. You can't say the Bible is a good book, but it's just wrong. Okay. So, there's one way, the Bible says uh, in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So, when you accept God into your life, you become a Christian. Okay? There is a difference in... Congratulations, Christian. (laughs) There's a difference in becoming a Christian... And being a Christian. That's a difference in qualifying for the Olympics and actually participating. That's a difference in getting your driver's license. And actually driving a car. 
That's yours. <laughs> so the point is that, yes, you become a Christian, but now you have to live the Christian life. And you don't live the Christian life by doing what your pastor tells you to do. Okay? You do what the Bible tells you to do. Hopefully your pastor is going to be preaching from the Bible, teaching from the Bible. But if he doesn't teach from the Bible, you should not listen to him or her. It may sound funny to you all. But there are a lot of churches right now that don't do what the Bible says. They're just social clubs. And they have rules and regulations that are socially oriented. And many of us have belonged to some of those churches before. And then when we come to Village Baptist Church, we have a problem. Because you're not doing it the way they were doing it at Missionary Baptist Church. Yeah, well, go back to Missionary Baptist Church. <laughs> okay? The point is that when you become a Christian, you have one GPS to show you where to go and how to get there. It's the Bible. The King James, New King James, New International Version, uh, uh, New American Standard Bible, New English Bible. It, depend, it doesn't matter what translation they have it in as long as it's not New, new World Translation. And you are to live by that Bible, right? Amen. And Tanisha, I found out that when I was looking through the Bible, I found in one book there, Hebrews chapter 19, verses, no, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. It tells me in there, it tells me what I have in Christ, what my standing is in Christ, and then it tells me because of my standing in Christ, there are some things that are commensurate with my position in Christ that I should be doing. And one of them is not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. So if the Bible says it, and you say you are a Christian, and Jesus is Lord, why is it that you don't want to obey it? It's just like saying, well, I got my driver's license, now I don't have to obey the law. Why do I have to stop at a stop sign? I already have my driver's license. <laughs> Is he testifying to it? <laughs> so it is really important we understand this. God is not trying to kill your joy. He's trying to make your joy complete. Bring it to the full. Amen. If you drink too much, don't get mad at God. <laughs> Can I still be a Christian because I'm drinking? Yes, but you cannot be a Christian if you're getting drunk. Amen. Amen. How much time do we have left? <laughs> So you can become a Christian and all it takes, you don't even, you don't need a degree, you don't need a high school diploma, you don't need anything to become a Christian. You just need to know that Jesus died for your sins and you have to accept him. But what it says though in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 is that you must accept him as Lord and Savior. You see, many of us like the Savior part. 
But the Lord won. Me, Lord? No. That is kind of really difficult. But the Bible says the only time that your salvation is complete is when you accept him as Lord and Savior. And his lordship in your life is based on the word of God. Our churches come with a lot of rules that make no sense at all when it comes to the Bible. But in order for you to be right with God, you've got to go by the Bible. So coming to church is really one important one. Okay? So you've got to come to church. Now, the Bible never says you must read your Bible every day. I'm sorry? Well, I'm not even sure if it assumes you're going to do that. But It tells you, if you want to have a full and blessed life, this is what you should do. Because you don't even have to argue about it. When you see a person that is blessed, when you see a person that is in the, in the will of God, it is a person that meditates upon the word of God day and night. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me ask you a question. The 49ers are playing. Let, let me, let me direct it to Jewel. <laughs> so Jewel, the 49ers are playing. <laughs> and they are going to give you a ticket that's going to allow you to see any game you want to see and you have to stand by harbor and sometimes even change the place and give him suggestions of whatever you want him to do okay But the only thing is, you have to go to Candlestick Park and get the ticket. (laughs) And that ticket will give you the privilege. If you look at the ticket, you read it, it's going to have everything in there. You're going to sit by the coach. You can change place anytime you want, whatever. You know, this is the ticket, but you got to go get it. Why in the world will you ask the person, why do I have to go get the ticket? Isn't that ridiculous? (laughs) But you see, that's why I didn't tell you about about God's team. Right, Sister Griffin? (laughs) But the point is this. The point is this. It's ridiculous when a Christian is asking, do I have to read the Bible? Do I have to go to church? Do I have to go to Bible study? Hello, fool. The ticket is going to get you. It's going to get you every place where God has prepared for you. It will get you to be, to sit with kings and princes. Why in the world you have a problem with that? Maybe you're not a Christian. You can be a 49er friend and ask him, why do I have to go there and get the ticket? It's ridiculous. Anyway, let's move to the last question. And the last question is going to have us look at Jude 
Verse 20. Jude. Verse 20. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. That's one more before we get to that. Okay. We're, we're, we're going to do this in five minutes. <laughs> because I, I, I need 15 minutes to deal with the last question. Um, the question, I know you asked it because I was sitting right next to you. Uh, does, oh, no, no, we're going to go back. We're going to go back to the last one. Okay, explain why the Bible commands us to honor our father and mother. Number one, that question cannot be answered. Okay? Because I can't explain what God has already commanded us. But I can tell you that it is the only command with promise. Okay. Now, now please, please, we have to get this right. When the Bible says, honor your father and your mother... It has cultural overtones with it. There should be no time that you don't honor your father or mother. There should be no time. Okay? But the word honor means to give weight to. To give weight to. In other words, I give weight to what you are. Honor God. Give weight to him. Give him his place. So when you honor your mother and your father, when you respect them, when you give weight to them, you are pleasing the Lord. But if you look in the New Testament, in the, in the passage in, in Ephesians, it is also very important that it gives commands also to parents. And in fact, with the parents, it says don't exasperate your children. In other words, the word exasperate is a good word that, uh, you know, it, it means don't let them throw up. Sometimes, some parents don't allow their children to honor them. Because you were really never there for your children. And if your children really never know you, don't come here telling me, you know, they have to honor me. A father doesn't mean bringing a human being through sexual contact. God is our father. A father is responsible. A father takes part in the life of his son or daughter. That's when you deserve honor. And parents also need to recognize when their children are no longer children. Amen. It's really interesting, and we don't have time. I said five minutes, right? I think I have one more minute. But 
But it's really interesting because some people think because I brought you into the world, I'm going to rule your life forever. <laughs> I mean, that's not according to the Bible. In fact, there is a place in the Bible where it says, For this shall a man leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, and whatever God has joined together, no man should set aside. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I can call Josh right now and say, hey, Josh, this is the way your house is going to be. I'm your father. No, that's his family. Amen. But out. That's not your place anymore. When your children are adults, they're no longer children. Amen, lights. <laughs> they're no longer children. Anyway, we don't have time to deal more with it. <laughs> but, but the point is this, though, that honor is something that is not bought. You don't buy honor. And you don't demand honor. Honor is earned. Amen. If you cursing your child out all her life or his life, when he or she curse you out, you have nothing to say about it. The Lord is good all the time. Amen. I'll give you some scriptures for that later. Yes. The promise is given in Exodus chapter 20 and it's repeated in Ephesians chapter 5. Okay. It's given first in Exodus chapter 20 and it's repeated again in Ephesians chapter 5. That God will honor you with life, long life, when you do that. When you do that. And then this one thing, there's a principle that I have, and it's not necessarily biblical, okay? It's just a principle. Amen? When my child is still in my house, Still eating the food I provide. Still sleeping on the bed I bought. Watching the TV I bought. They have to do what I say. Amen. have less than 15 minutes now for uh, Jude chapter, I mean verse 20. Jude verse 20. And the question basically is, can you explain Jude one twenty, and what is meant by pray in the Holy Spirit? I recently heard a speaker talking about this scripture and saying that, that it means to pray in tongues. My question is, how is this so when speaking in tongues is a gift? Am I correct? And not everyone has been given that gift. So let's look at the passage again. Uh, Jude, verse 20. But you, dear friends, build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray 
in the Holy Spirit. Verse 21. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. In fact, when you hear but, there's always something before it. So let's go back a few verses and see what the but was all about. Okay? We're going to start with another but. Verse 17. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, my friends, build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. So, only simple Ignorant people will say this is talking about gift of tongues. I'm going to shorten it because of time. But if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in context, that is, you've read 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 13, you will come out with the conclusion that I have and most reasonable Bible students have concluded that the gift of tongues is not to be used in public unless there is an interpretation. Prayer is speaking to God. Why would you need someone to interpret your prayer? You're not talking to me. Why do I need your interpretation? You're talking to God. Therefore, if you're praying in tongues, it doesn't need interpretation because the Bible says you're doing it in private. But whenever you speak in tongues in public, the Bible says to or at the most three at one service. And it should always be interpreted. So there's no way that Jude is talking about praying in tongues. Praying in the spirit. In fact, that is not the only thing we are asked to do in the spirit. We are to walk yeah. in the spirit. Is that a tongue walking? Doing anything in the Spirit is doing it under the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. That is why we worship in the Spirit. That's why we walk in the Spirit. That's why we pray in the Spirit. That's why we sing in the Spirit. So that you are under the control of the Almighty God. And if you're praying in the Spirit, you're going to pray according to the will of God. Because you're directed by the Spirit of God. Amen. You can close your eyes. Say, Lord, I thank you. The lottery has gone up to 200 million now. <laughs> Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. I'm in the spirit now. I'm going to win that lottery. (laughs) Oh, you can go to your closet. Say, Lord, I was just minding my business today at the 24-hour Northwest. And I saw this young muscular man. Uh, Lord, I know he's not saved. Hallelujah. But I want him, Lord. Give him to me, Lord. I'm doing it in your spirit, Lord. If you're praying in the spirit, you won't pray that prayer because it's not according to his word. It's not according to his word. Amen. That's nowhere in the Bible that says don't play the lottery. But don't get the Holy Spirit involved. Say, I pray, I'm going to get it. No. Yes. <laughs> we have a reporter that has a question. That's a change. I should be asking you quite. No, go ahead. <laughs> Amen. We'll build a new church. A new building. <laughs> Amen. But it is it is important though that we understand that praying in the spirit because we all if you are a Christian you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You are a Christian. So you have no choice but to pray in the spirit. And any other prayer you're doing that's not in the spirit that doesn't mean we Christians don't pray. You know, some of our prayers are cold. Amen. Some of our prayers don't leave this building. Amen. They're just bouncing against the wall. Bow, bow, playing ping pong. Because you know where you were last night. Amen. Before you came to church, you cursed your husband out. You came here and got all spiritual. Lord Jesus. <laughs> Your prayer didn't go anywhere. That's why the Bible said, pray in the Spirit. Be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Be in the Spirit of God Almighty. And if you do so, in fact, the Bible says, we are under the Spirit of God. We have been saved by the Spirit of God. We are now the pneumaticos, men and women of the spirit of the almighty God. There are going to be some things God is going to burn out in our lives, but we are always going to be saved because we trust in the him who said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Let us pray.